Dear colleagues, dear guests, dear students, it's my pleasure and my honor to open this year's AMO lecture with a lecture of Professor Arjun Apadurai from New York University. Just a reminder to those who are not acquainted uh, with the name AMO lecture, it's dedicated to Anton Wilhelm Amo, the first African student in Halle, who was abducted from his homeland, that's in today's Ghana, in 1707, something like this, by a Dutch company, and then left as a gift to the Duke of Braunschweig, Wolfenbüttel. And this was in 1707, so uh, we have at least one date. It was fashionable at this time among the European nobility to have a sweet black child as a servant at home. Problems arose when those uh, young persons grew up and were not that sweet anymore. But uh, Amo was lucky because the Duke of Braunschweig paid his education in a traditional classic sense and his presence as, as a student first and then as a teacher at Halle University where he came to at 1727 and where he was uh, promoted, he became a doctor at our university and was active as a teacher. Later, he moved to Jena, where unfortunately he became the victim of racist insults. And also his beneficiary, the Duke of Braunschweig, had died. So he left for Ghana in 1747. Obviously, he was a very respected man there. We have the report of a Swiss uh, doctor on a Dutch ship and who said in 1753 that he had visited the famous professor Anton Wilhelm Amo in today's Axim in Ghana. So, uh, we are proud that this person was a doctor at our university on the one hand. On the one hand, on the other hand, he is a permanent reminder that uh, still today we are facing racism and discrimination and well, we have to put something against this. And uh, this will, this lecture is part of our efforts to do this. We will now have a presentation of Professor Arjun Apadurai by my friend and colleague Richard Rottenberg, and then we shall listen to Professor Apadurai. Thank you for being here, and uh, welcome. Hello everybody, dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, dear Arjun, thank you for having come. It's my distinguished pleasure to not really introduce to you Ar Arjun Apadurai because, uh, because you certainly know uh, him from the literature, but it's uh, my, still my distinguished pleasure to introduce him to you in person. When I spent the academic year 1415 in New York, it was one of my official tasks to enhance American-German academic exchange, and one of my little contributions is to invite Arjun to this little event, and so I'm very grateful that you accepted this invitation. Uh, Arjun is an anthropologist, but he is recognized as a major theorist in global studies which is not exactly anthropology, but uh, has a lot to do with anthropology. In his work, by and large, he discusses the importance of modernity of nation states in, the, in situations of globalization. Um, while he was born and raised in India, he is in fact an American scholar who, who has his PhD from the University of Chicago. 
He was then a professor of uh, anthropology at the University of Chicago, later uh, the, the director of the Yale Center for the Study of Globalization, and then professor and provost at the New School, for, uh, the New School in, in New York, and currently he's professor of media, and cul media culture and communication at uh, New York University. In addition to this uh, splendid academic career, Arjun had important roles, or keeps on having important roles in many public and private organizations all over the world, but mainly in the US and in India, such as the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the UNESCO, the World Bank, and many others. Always dealing within these organizations with public issues and long-term issues of globalization, modernity, and conflicts. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences since 1997. Now, many of us who have been trained in anthropology uh, in the 70s were, so to speak, during their training, not really aware of his work, but recently afterwards, because quickly and uh, overwhelmingly became aware of his work. For instance, already in 1986, he edited a volume, The Social Life of Things, Commodities in Cultural Perspective, which uh, became one of the more successful edited volumes ever. And there, are, there are hardly anthropology students who are not, not aware of this volume. In 1999, he published a paper, Disjuncture and Difference in the Global Cultural Economy, in the journal Theory, Culture, and Society, uh, which uh, became extremely wide read and uh, enormously frequently s cited, uh, which coins the notion of mediascapes. And there were generations of students who would deal with mediascapes and all other sorts of scapes, which were then invented and finally trivialized in the, in the shadow of the original idea of what a mediascape is. In 1991, he published uh, the, the paper Global Ethnoscapes, Notes and Curies for a Transnational Anthropology, which became one of the central pieces to refer to when the question is what is the entity anthropology studies and what does it mean if anthropology is about transnational links. Uh, this, of course, raises the next question, what then is locality about? So, consequentially, in 1995, he, he published an influential paper, the, the Production of Locality. And all of this somehow culminated in 1996, the book Modernity at Large, Cultural Dimensions of Globalization, which is by now one of the classics of uh, globalization studies. Um, I was particularly uh, influenced and impressed, impressed by a paper of 1998, uh, Dead Certainty, Ethnic Violence in the Era of Globalization, which is, uh, as the title easily says, a sad topic. Dead Certainty is about uh, the consequential end of identitarian politics when you, your true identity is uh, achieved when you are being killed by your enemy, then you finally are a Tutsi forever. The act of killing makes you a Tutsi with dead certainty. And uh, for me, this was an enormously insightful paper. Uh, in 2000, he edited the, the first with the public culture and then as an independent uh, uh, book, uh, the, the Reader on Globalization. And uh, in 2006 already saw the next influential uh, book, Fear of Small Numbers, an essay on the geography of anger. And in 2013, with his book, The Future is Cultural Fact, Essays on the Global Condition, he, I'm not sure whether he coined or he contributed to the coining of the, the notion global condition of which some of our colleagues around here are particularly uh, about which are some of our colleagues are particularly curious because they, they are trying to put together a, a forum for the study of the global uh, condition between the four universities uh, here around uh, Halle, Leipzig, uh, 
Erfurt and uh, where's the other one? Yeah. Jena. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. And uh, so today Arjun is here to speak about the future of, so of the sovereignty of the nation state in times of identitarian politics. And I'm really pleased and grateful uh, that you came. And uh, I kindly ask you to come and deliver your talk. Thank you for your attention. very honored to uh, be here uh, as a guest of uh, Richard and Matthias and their colleagues both uh, in the university, in the Institute for Anthropology and in various connected projects, which I know reach well beyond uh, this university but are centered here. Uh, I've not been to this city before or to this university so uh, it's wonderful uh, at this advanced age to be able to come to a new place and a new institution, new to me that is, and to uh, see something of uh, it firsthand because of course Halle is uh, known for uh, many of its activities and its uh, scholars. So I'm delighted but I'm also uh, deeply honored uh, to be here in the context of this particular uh, series uh, named for Amo, the gentleman that you just heard about, and I must admit that I did not know till today uh, when I was on the train from Berlin to here when I looked up the name and the person uh, who he was, and in the course of the day and through some conversations with uh, people here, I am feeling a little less ashamed because I see that I'm in a uh, very big company of people who do not know what they should know about Amo because this is a completely stunning story and I'm uh, committed to learning whatever can be learned uh, about this extraordinary person uh, about whom I gather the archival uh, traces are not many and that may partly account for why he is not talked about all the time and I'll just tell you uh, as a side note before I go into my task and my topic today, uh, that not only was I amazed by this man and his history in this crucial century, in this crucial moment, in this time, um, in Germany, in Europe, uh, more generally, uh, but I'm um, really uh, uh, very uh, affected by the conditions of uh, his uh, working life, uh, his uh, stature, and uh, his uh, sad, I guess, return to Ghana and apparently his death in somewhat obscure circumstances. But I'm especially uh, affected because I have a small book that I'm uh, thinking about, uh, I think that's the best way to put it, and I've begun to think about, trying to look again at a very old question, which is, uh, or an old issue, uh, which is not uh, so much discussed, which is how could uh, the European Enlightenment coexist with uh, the global imperial regime of Europe? which in every way, point by point, contradicts the ideals of the Enlightenment. Now, there are, of course, some obvious and available answers, but I think they're poor answers, which say that the ideas don't matter, or that this was just hypocrisy, or there was really, the empire was really about property and wealth and power, and these ideas were just a kind of thin side point, or some such theory. Well, I'm not convinced by any of these, and I think there's something much deeper which uh, needs to be tackled uh, in order to understand how you could have these great ideas as well as this really uh, disturbing uh, world uh, uh, 
moment uh, of European uh, conquest and control, domination, hegemony, and indeed savagery uh, on a worldwide basis. This is not a small, a small thing. And then I see this story about Amo, and I think, oh my, here is a black man planted here, abducted indeed, uh, and then gifted, you know, commoditized, moved around, though in very privileged circumstances, but then becomes the extraordinary savant, a learned man at the height of the Enlightenment, but coming from the most uh, difficult spaces of the early modern world in Europe. Just stunning. So I have both uh, uh, reasons to be stunned by this individual and my own project uh, to think, what does a story like this tell us about the coexistence of enlightenment and empire? Anyway, that's just a side note to say, therefore, why I'm uh, doubly moved and honored by being here in that, this context of the Amo lecture. That said, I'll just repeat my title, which is uh, the title I gave uh, my hosts, uh, and the title is The Precarious Future of national sovereignty. At least since the early 1990s, I have been involved in debates about the future of the nation state. In the 1990s, and Richard kindly mentioned some of the points of this, of this uh, journey, I took a normative position uh, against the nation state and also predicted its demise. Subsequent history, and the criticisms that I have encountered at that time led me to rethink my position somewhat. I now do not see the nation state as likely to disappear soon. Indeed, the number of nation states has grown, and there are new aspirants to nationhood on the horizon. Still, I believe the future of the nation state is precarious and, all, and that all nation states are facing crises of one kind or another. From the point of view of sovereignty, which is the hallmark of all definitions of the nation state, there is certainly a crisis, one that is produced by a new ecology of sovereignty. My aim today is to describe this new ecology, sketch some of the factors that have produced it, and raise some questions about what this new ecology portends for national sovereignty. So a bit of a, a discussion now about the classic model of national sovereignty and some of the challenges it's facing. The current global architecture of sovereignty has its direct roots in the peace of Westphalia, uh, where a variety of European actors gave birth to a non-religious and non-imperial idea of sovereignty. This event is commonly and rightly seen as marking the birth of the modern nation state, which rests on the legal recognition of its territorial borders, uh, the monopoly of legitimate violence within these borders, and the obligation to provide the basic conditions of security and livelihood to its citizens defined as people within those territorial borders. The modern nation state is in, uh, unique in the history of human affairs in that it rests on the universal and mutual recognition of internal sovereignty between each state, which claims to be a nation state. The global spread of the, uh, this architecture uh, characterizes Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East in the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, and uh, was accompanied by many other important processes, such as the growth of trans-regional industrial capitalism, the spread of what Benedict Anderson famously called print capitalism, and eventually the growth of anti-imperial movements and the push for decolonization and self-determination on a worldwide basis. The primary challenge that faces this architecture of sovereignty is that it rests on the idea of a single envelope in which national identity, territorial sovereignty, and legal citizenship are contained, a single envelope. This is an ambitious and utopian idea whose fragility we are now being forced to recognize. The reasons for this fragility lie in the steady globalization of capital, 
with its push for open economic borders, free movement of labor and raw materials, and coordinated activities among producers and consumers on a worldwide basis. Each of these factors puts the architecture of the nation state under severe stress. The biggest symptom of this crisis of sovereignty is that no modern nation state controls what could be called its national economy. This is equally a problem for the richest and poorest of nations. The United States economy is substantially in Chinese and Saudi hands. The Chinese depend crucially on raw materials from Africa and Latin America, as well as other parts of Asia. Everyone depends to some extent on Middle Eastern oil, and virtually all modern nation states depend on sophisticated armaments from a small number of wealthy countries. Economic sovereignty as a basis for national sovereignty was always a shaky principle. Today it is plainly marginal, perhaps even irrelevant. In the absence of any national economy which modern nation states can claim to protect and develop, it is no surprise that there's been a worldwide tendency in effective states to demonstrate national sovereignty by turning towards cultural majoritarianism, ethno-nationalism, and the stifling of internal intellectual and cultural dissent. In other words, the loss of economic sovereignty everywhere produces a trend towards emphasizing cultural sovereignty. This move towards cultural sovereignty as the main theater for the expression of the value of the nation state has dark consequences for any unwanted or undocumented border crossers, especially those seeking refuge and asylum. It also, by the way, and I won't say a lot about this, but it's important to note, this cultural sovereignty move also has dark implications for free speech, sexual freedom, art, universities, and I'm telling this story all from the point of view of what is often referred to as the world's most populous democracy, India, the country in which I was born, and on which I still do my research. Uh, few of you are aware, and again I say this informally, that uh, India today is witnessing an unprecedented degree of what can only be called repression. Repression of free speech, repression of secularity, repression of sexual freedom, repression of women, misogyny. Uh, this sounds like what will happen when Trump comes to power, but let me tell you, it's in play in India already, and it also is affecting the control of universities, the control of textbooks, all the things we think of as belonging to the era or to the style of uh, totalitarianism. These are in play in India, um, and India is a huge electoral democracy. So loss of uh, economic sovereignty means cultural sovereignty, but cultural sovereignty as interpreted by states and other political elites is massively an exercise in cultural disciplining and repression. So this is a side point, but a big one has to do with uh, border crossing, because if cultural sovereignty is your game, you can't afford to have people disturbing the ship uh, at all times who come from here and there. I'm going to come back to this in just a moment. Fear of outsiders who might threaten cultural purity and sovereignty is enhanced by another problem, namely the norms of legal citizenship in most modern nation states, all of which stress biological, linguistic, or ethnic markers of a documentable historical connection to those defined as full citizens. This is the deep meaning behind any and all modern ideas of naturalization as they are applied to migrants and other claimants to legal citizenship. The narrative of modern citizenship cannot envisage any claim to citizenship which is not based on assimilation to the current norms of national belonging that remain primarily cultural rather than political. Put even more simply, all refugee claims to citizenship in the lands to which they come and where they eventually wish to live are about aspiration and not about identification. So the real difference of consequence is not between humanitarian refugees and economic refugees, but rather between what we might call aspirational refugees against what we might call escape refugees. All refugees and indeed all migrants arriving in new places 
uh, arrive in new places because of some sort of aspiration, whether it is to the good life in terms of livelihood or in terms of a new community in which they can be physically safe. And it is the aspiration to the good life which is what they really share with those who are already citizens of the receiving countries. The divide between economic refugees and refugees who are fleeing tyranny or discrimination is a distraction from this other reality. National citizenship is everywhere in danger of becoming a series of lifeboats in which those already aboard are encouraged to push others back into the water simply on the grounds that there's no more room. And of course, uh, in Germany, uh, I don't need to tell you this, the variant on this has to do with that old uh, legal structure which emphasizes blood and blood connections explicitly for German citizenship. And as you know, that's a very live uh, basis for the return of Germans who are in other countries throughout the 20th century, uh, a story about which I'm learning more and more uh, recently, but it's also the basis of many other things. But the German case is a variation. It's, you might say, admirably explicit that blood is the key. But honestly, there is no nation state which can say, for example, that we are India, we are not Pakistan, without going to some idea of ethnos and actually of biological uh, essence. There is no way, and I've argued this many times, to have a national identity on which then the nation state is based, which is not somehow biophysical in nature. It can never be abstract. This is the problem of saying, let us have universal for example, ideas about citizenship, or let us bring in people on the basis of uh, humanitarian considerations and so on, because there's something else always rubbing against it, which is we are special because we share something. So whether it's language, uh, explicitly blood, birth, parenthood, something else, it all comes always back to the body. That's the thing that we have in common that defines where we end and let's say France begins, or Holland begins, all places as we know, that were all overlapping kingdoms and empires and so on and so forth, uh, but suddenly become uh, separate and separate in some kind of sacred way. The final deep problem, and I'll come back to refugees several times in the course of my conversation, since obviously it's a major issue uh, in Europe today and actually in many parts of the world. The final deep problem of modern sovereignty, the sovereignty built on the architecture of nation states, is that it is simply not capable of handling the world's biggest problems, all of which are trans-regional and sometimes even trans-human in their scale. Terrorism, the illegal arms trade, human trafficking, epidemic diseases, and above all, climate are factors which clearly do not respect national boundaries. And of these many challenges which are planetary and which therefore national organization can by definition not tackle, I want to focus on one, uh, which is the, also the topic of some work I've done in the last four or five years, the challenge of the new forms of financialized capital. A primary threat to international order, so I've spoken already about the loss of economic sovereignty worldwide, that no nation state can claim to really have a national economy anymore, doesn't exist. But if you ask why exactly, how exactly does that work today, it has everything to do with finance, not just capitalism in general or industrial capitalism, something very specific. Uh, a primary threat to international order is the volatility of global financial markets. Capitalism today surrounds and saturates us in a way it never did before. In its home regions, notably in the United States, it has taken the form of deep financialization. Finance now ex far exceeds the sphere of production and manufacture of industrial goods. And I'll give you one or two numbers in a moment to just concretize that observation. Since the early 70s, which is, by the way, my marker, when does this period begin? Early 70s, in my view. We have had the rapid development of a host of financial instruments which were barely imaginable in the time of Marx. The breakthrough that made this financial explosion possible was the idea that risk itself could be monetized, allowing a small set of actors to take risks on risks. This is the core of the logic of the derivative. 
an instrument that has allowed financial technicians and managers to make virtually every aspect of our everyday lives susceptible to monetization. In, in this way, housing has now been turned into a machine for monetizing mortgages. You'll recognize here, by the way, that this is coming from a US perspective. These are things that are only partly on the way in other places. Germany, for example, where there's an admirable resistance to buying homes at all, uh, though I think many people don't like that resistance, but there are good reasons to, uh, to endorse it. Or India, where the mortgage market simply is not yet really arrived in as big a way, uh, etc. But uh, housing has now been turned into a machine for monetizing mortgages. The environment has been monetized through carbon trading and many other derivatives. Education has been captured through sophisticated methods of creating student debt. Health, uh, health and insurance have been thoroughly penetrated by models of risk, arbitrage, and bets on the future. In short, everyday life is linked to capital, not so much by the mechanism of the surplus value of labor, but through making us all risk bearers whose aggregate risk can be endlessly combined and recombined to provide new forms of risk taking and profit making by the financial industries. We are all laborers now, regardless of what we do, insofar as our primary reason for being is to enter into debt through being forced to monetize the risks of health, security, education, housing, and much else in our lives. This situation is most visible in the advanced capitalist countries and hence the financial collapse of 2008 was primarily felt and amplified in these very countries. The US notably, but Europe to a considerable extent and other parts of the world in sectoral ways. Uh, but very few countries in the world escaped the effects of the collapse since finance capital has been spreading its activities worldwide for at least the last 30 years. Still, many parts of the global south, including, for example, South Africa and India, did not experience the shock of the collapse as profoundly as did the US and Europe. The buffers that created this measure of insulation were primarily the new derivative logics, creating multiple loops between debt, risk, and speculation were less advanced in these countries. Another way to put it is that in the countries of the global south, the process by which all debt is made potentially monetizable through derivative instruments has been less rapid and more uneven than it has been in the countries of the North Atlantic. I have to make a footnote here and say this is not an argument that is simply echoing, for example, uh, our anthropological colleague David Graeber in his book 5,000 Years of Debt and so on, which ends the story roughly in 1970. <laughs> Very little to say about this word I'm talking about. I'm mainly concerned not with the long history of debt, the fact that debt is everywhere, has always been around and so on, that's all fine. But debt has a completely new capacity to produce new wealth as a consequence of the creation of derivative. And again, I'll make an aside, although the group that I'm involved with, I have a small group uh, that I've been working with, is working on cultural approaches to the derivative and analyzing this form. There's a very specific history here which has to do with a Nobel Prize winning activity that crosses over from economics into finance. It's not straightforward neoclassical economics. And it has to do with options pricing. The big names here are Black and Scholes, C-S-C-H-O-L-E-S. -E if I was a more visually deaf person, I'd have some nice slides here, Black Scholes equation, Black Scholes model. These are somewhat obscure to people who don't study finance, but they are very vital things. 1973, this is a way to price options. That is, what will happen to future prices in a way that I can sell my prediction about future price to you today. The question how to price that, which is how trading happens, is an invention. It's an invention of 1973 which says, how do you price these things? It's a mathematical model. It's a little box into which any trader, without being a fancy mathematician, can feed some information and get a price out of it. And then he puts his price to his counterpart, who may have a slightly different reading of the model, and they come to an agreement and they sell a derivative. A sell a derivative. And a derivative simply is something built on something else. It's a derivation. Uh, but the main thing it's about is a prior risk. So 
The question is then to take a risk on that risk. How will that risk play out in five years? And well, if you have a derivative instrument, you can then say, oh, but what happened to that derivative instrument? And on it goes. There is no logical limit. And indeed, if you look at the derivatives market, there are millions of kinds of derivatives for this reason. Once you have a derivative, you can have a derivative of it, and so on and so forth. OK, that's just a technical aside, though I'm happy to say more uh, informally about this. However, the global spread of the capitalist imaginary has been no, by no means, though its impact in the global south was somewhat limited by the course of history, the global spread of this imaginary focused on derivative wealth, wealth created by these derivative instruments, has by no means been arrested or compromised since 07, 08, when the housing collapse occurred in the US and its ripples were felt worldwide. Banks, hedge funds, and insurance companies are aggressively pushing their way into new markets, seeking to lobby for legislation that will allow them to bring the same untrammeled debt markets from which they profited and which also crashed in 2008 to the countries of the global south. Thus, it is only a matter of time before the countries of the global south also find themselves fully exposed to the volatility, inscrutability, and extra reality of the derivative-based financial markets of the North. As James Baldwin once said in another context, no more water, the fire next time. And just to tell you something in one sentence, one number, the global market, the, the dollar value of the global market in these exotic instruments, which are the center of the financial industry, is five to six times in trillions of dollars, the aggregate GDP of the world. So you can take all of the world's GDP and put it in one basket. Six times that is the actual wealth of what is moving the derivatives market. Now, I have two things to say about that. One is scale. So this is not some small thing. The second thing is a bigger debate, which I won't get into today because I want to go elsewhere from, uh, for the story about sovereignty, though this is a, a, a vital story, is unlike... Uh, Many of my colleagues, especially those on the left, my group and I do not believe that this new wealth coming out of financialized capital, coming out of derivatives, is fictitious in any way. First of all, it's fully real. We believe this is real wealth. Secondly, we do not believe in refusal. In other words, we are not uh, uh, aligned with the Occupy movement or with David Graeber or any of its other voices because they want to walk away from it. They say, this is bad news. This is part of the long history, 5,000 years of debt. This is just debt on a bigger scale. Refuse it. Walk away. Shut the banks down. Don't pay your loans, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're not aligned with this view. Mm -hmm. And our view, uh, again, I won't go into great detail, is this is real wealth that needs to be socially reappropriated. In other words, furthermore, the horse is out of the barn. Refusal doesn't work. <laughs> This is like saying, let's refuse industrial capitalism. Well, give it a try. You, know? you can't do that. The only way you can refuse industrial capitalism is by going to financial capitalism. There's no turning the clock back. So our view as a group, this is a political view and an ethical view, is this is real wealth. But the question is, how does it get appropriated and distributed in a different manner? And we don't believe this can be done by things like the Tobin tax, where you charge 1% on every financial transaction, put that in some kind of fund, and apply it to social causes. We believe that it's a matter of creating widespread global literacy so that all of us can understand how this works. And it's not very mysterious, because the people doing all this trading are not all mathematical geniuses. They have a little black box, and they have a Bloomberg terminal, and they put the numbers and they trade with each other, with your money and mine. And <clears throat> that's the key. The money is not printed in the bank. It's all social wealth pumped up on steroids and then traded and traded and traded again. And lo and behold, 98% of the benefits and the profits of that risk go to those doing the trading or those controlling and managing them. And the downside risk goes to us. Our mortgages go underwater and so on and so forth. We go deeper into student debt, etc. But the actual money is coming from us. In this sense, Marx's story is still relevant. It's still us. But it's not our labor whose relative surplus value is being milked off by the capitalists. It is something else. It's our capacity to produce debt. Somebody has figured out, oh, that's good. And not only because I'll take your money and charge you high interest. Those days are gone. 
No, it's about monetizing that debt and aggregating in new forms of risk, which can then be traded, producing new wealth and so on. It's quite a magical machine, but alas, it's not fictive and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so, our view is that there's a way to re-socialize this, not to refuse it, walk away, shut down the banks, no, uh, don't do finance and so on and so forth, but to uh, get, for example, labor unions, students, universities, uh, pension funds, to actually control, to play in this market. So that it's not that 99 people provide the wealth and 1% you know, trades the money and makes the profit. <coughs> Let's all get into it, because actually it is these derivative instruments are a way of bringing future value into the present. That is their actual technical breakthrough. And it's, not, it's a technical breakthrough we can all benefit from. But at the moment, very few of us benefit from it. That's a short uh, reading on, on my view of where to go with this. But today, I don't want to go in, in that uh, direction. Uh, what I want to do uh, is to uh, simply uh, move on. What I uh, aimed to uh, achieve is to just give you a sense that National sovereignty, my main topic today, is not only under threat vaguely because goods and services and expertise are moving across borders, but because financial capital is the dominant form of capital and it relies on this derivative market, which is even more resolutely not about national boundaries in its speed, in its scale, in its instruments and its techniques, and so on and so forth. So there's a way around it. But it's not going to be because this or that nation finds a way to regulate this market. It has to be something more uh, general. Now, I want to return, having given you uh, a kind of detour into a very particular sense in which the current global economy makes it impossible, in my view, to be managed from the point of view of any nation state, be it the US, be it Germany, the wealthiest the strongest, the most stable, and so on, can't do anything uh, uh, about this on a national basis. But I want to come back now um, to the issue of uh, refugees. Having already hinted to you that I believe that the question of refugees is also uh, a, a huge challenge to the current order uh, of nation states, and I'm now uh, introducing the notion that there are two sides to this. One is that the very basis of the nation state is at fundamental odds with the idea of uh, bringing others in because of its essentially ethno-biological foundation everywhere, everywhere. Secondly, I've tried to say that the nature of the global economy is such that national regulation uh, uh, is impossible. A national economy does not exist. Therefore, cultural sovereignty is crucial. Therefore, every nation state has no choice but to play the cultural card. So honestly, it doesn't matter how far right you are. So it's not only that our fear has to come from the far right, that is of course terrifying, but anyone managing the modern nation state has to play the cultural card and somehow we protectionists can try and put the horse back in the barn because there is no national economy left. There are no clothes for the emperor from that point of view. So everybody has to play the cultural card and in that context, the least welcome thing is aliens, strangers, migrants, uh, refugees. So <clears throat> I want to turn briefly now to uh, this migrant question and just share two uh, or three uh, thoughts about it and then make my way to a kind of uh, conclusion. So while the current refugee crisis in Europe is very much on our minds here, in, in Germany particularly, we cannot forget other cases like those of the Rohingya in Burma and elsewhere in South Asia, the many climate-based refugees of Saharan Africa and the internally displaced people of many countries in Asia, the Middle East, and South Africa. And I think this broader perspective will help us to recall the longer-term causes of refugee status, causes, the push factor, rather than the reception issue, which is mostly in our minds in, in Europe, but the push factor, uh, and the causes range from political oppression to religious conflict to climate change, very important, economic hardship and regime change, just to pick the big ones. This global perspective, I think, can also help us to understand 
and develop better ideas about the legal status of refugees, their definition under national and international laws, and the difficulties associated with gaining asylum in the countries to which refugees travel. There is, as I've already hinted, a deep and unresolved tension between refugee status, national sovereignty, and the comparative challenges of acquiring citizenship without prior claims on affinity through blood, language, or even employment. This tension cannot be separated from the issue of urbanization. I'm gonna say there are three things that I think the refugee crisis is also connected to. One is uh, the question of cities. Um, now, all of you know that this century has been uh, deemed by the UN, the World Bank, many, many, uh, as, the, as the century of urbanization. And the short, simple number to give you that most people agree on is that by roughly 2050, in about 20 years or 25 years, uh, maybe 60% of the world's population will be in cities. Maybe 60% of that population will be in very big cities, which means 10 million, 20 million, and up. And a very large percentage of those very big cities will be radically unequal. Almost everyone agrees on these three things. The question is, can we and the Millennium Goals of the UN and so on, all about can we deflect that, those tendencies? Can we move less people to cities? That means solving the agrarian crisis and so on. Can we make those cities less unequal? And so on and so forth. But the cities are a very big uh, part uh, of the picture as far as uh, the refugee situation is concerned, though many refugees do come from uh, pastoral, peasant, and other backgrounds, it is true that the incapacity of cities close to home is one of the big reasons people are prepared to make the journey uh, across the Mediterranean, across Europe, across the English Channel, and so on and so forth, is because Mumbai and Cairo and Lagos and Mexico City are becoming impossible and unlivable places. The urban crisis uh, cannot be uh, forgotten. And uh, here, too, the story is not completely separate from the story of financialization because if you look at these huge growing big cities worldwide, cities of 10 million, numbers like 15 million, 20 million, 25 million, which used to be stunning numbers even 10 years ago. Somebody used to tell me Mexico City is gonna be 30 million. I would go, wow. Now, China probably has 100 cities, which are already that. The question is when will they become cities of 50 million, 60 million, and so on. Remarkable numbers. All those cities, rest on many things, but one thing they rest on is real estate. Real estate is a developer's world. The development world is a pure investment world, and where there's investment, there's finance. Connect the dots. So the global world of derivative finance is always watching the housing market closely because there is huge money to be made in housing. The Chinese know this very well. Beijing, Shanghai, and 100 other Chinese cities are treasure houses for developers. So even under the communist regime in China, real estate is a huge wealth machine. And the Chinese state, the party, has a very tough time. It cannot stop that process. If you stop that process, there are hundreds of millions of people who are building those bloody things. Laborers who are semi-citizens in Chinese cities, what are you going to do with them? Send them back? No way. So there's no easy way to regulate all that. Global finance is involved. So the growth of the world cities is not at all connect, unconnected to the business of the, uh, of the workings of financial capital and the generation of untold quantities of wealth through the growth of the world cities and in turn, those unlivable cities because they are unequal. The nature of global capital and in its urban housing form is not to worry about social housing, is not to worry about slum dwellers, is not to worry about this that. It is to worry about who can you sell that three bedroom condo and I do see in Berlin where I'm living now that that process has arrived, even in a fairly tightly regulated city, which is not New York, where anybody who has one inch of land can build a very tall building on the size of this. If I own this much, I can build a very tall building and sell it off to somebody. But I mean, in Germany, there are rules about that, but people are pushing, well, how high can I build? Maybe five floors, good enough, I'll do it, etc. The other two big, so, so the, the urban issue as we watch, the other two major things are uh, the media, 
again, I'm in a department now called Media, Culture, and Communication. And I do want to say that uh, uh, this is a huge subject, but it is also a subject connected to the kinds of crises the nation state cannot handle because media, by its nature, is now profoundly uh, non-territorial in its reach and, and scope. We all know that the major uh, corporate organizations that control global media are largely uh, transnational, not just multinational. Uh, their loyalty is no, not to any particular place. They may be based here and there, but they really have a worldwide writ. Uh, you only just have to look at the large television uh, companies and also the, the, the consolidation of publishing, TV, and so on into single hands. There's been very good analyses of these things. Media is usually involved, but with media, you also see a couple of very important things, and I just want to note them in regard particularly to the refugee crisis and the question of sovereignty, because there's tons that could be said about media. I don't want to go off into all those directions. What I do want to say is uh, that it is noteworthy to me that uh, bad news still is incredibly more uh, fast, swift, and far-reaching than any form of good news. It's very intriguing to me, and I don't believe that this is something eternal or divinely decreed. There's something about the way uh, things are organized such that uh, hate messages, divisive messages, exclusionary messages, protectionist messages, racist messages, on and on the list goes, uh, seem to have a much bigger capacity to capture both official media and social media, which is, of course, the major way in which things travel very fast is by social media, as we all uh, know. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all their cousins uh, worldwide uh, are all much friendlier to bad news. So again, to make an aside, the, the success of ISIS, for example, we all know, is not unconnected to their media skills, but the media skills, in turn, are tied up to something which all the media benefit from, which is the speed and effectiveness of bad news communication, which is all the way from hate to propaganda, moves much faster than the tons of interesting progressive and good news that we do have on a worldwide basis. So it's not as if social reality is entirely bankrupt in, in having progressive things to report on, but, but, the, but the, the worthiness of such news or such communication to corporate media is limited, but stunningly to social media as well. So we have progressive activist organizations. Again, I know India well. There are hundreds of thousands of NGOs doing remarkable stuff on a local basis, on a district basis, on a village basis, on a state basis, on a national basis. But how much do you know about them? How much people in India know about them? Not very much. And so there again, we have some very complex uh, uh, links uh, that make the new, the new, the, the old, the old media in its new forms and the new media not really uh, very helpful in resolving the tension between uh, uh, national sovereignty and these planetary problems, of which the refugee problem is perhaps uh, one of the most uh, important. Now, it is true, it is true uh, that new media have also been helpful to people who are in vulnerable situations, to people making the refugee journey. We all know this, that, people, uh, that refugees have used social media to, to map their journeys, to share information, and so on. But the role of that is very small compared to the role of surveillance, the role of media, big data, another word I've not said much about, uh, pattern seeking and surveillance being done by the major European agencies. Uh, I don't know how many of you know are, are now closely following the EU official apparatus, uh, security apparatus in relation to refugees, uh, it has two sides. One is zero interest in the individual, simply scanning the Mediterranean and so on for boats, because you don't want to know who's there. Are they, are they refugees? Are they, are they asylum seekers? Because if you know somebody's an asylum seeker, you have to deal with them differently. Turn the boat back. But the minute you cross into the European border, it's all about you as an individual. And there's a whole separate agency which oversees that, from the agency which does the area and other surveying of boats and other large populations. So it's a very elaborate uh, apparatus of surveillance that involves big data as well as personal identification, biometrics, tracking who you are, and so on. So it's a massive, massive 
uh, business, which is, uh, again, part of the tectonic struggle between national and the case of EU, EU citizenship and the question of people from Syria, Iraq, North Africa, and so on, it's also being played out on the terrain uh, of media. So, and so uh, with the refugee crisis and with all these crises, uh, the nation state, the, the, the state of affairs, the question is, can it be modified? And I want to make a few remarks in, in my last uh, few minutes about this. One approach is to continue to try to inject more force and credibility into the current architecture of national sovereignty, both at the sending and receiving ends. In other words, strengthen the nation state. It's weak, let's strengthen it. This is, in my opinion, a losing strategy, since there is no way to weaken those states which we consider to be bad, while strengthening those states we consider to be good, since both draw strength from the same legal and architectural principles. This is one angle, by the way, on the Syrian crisis. Is, you know, picking out the good guys and bad guys is one thing, but the point of what is about the rest of the nation states? What about the nation states who are the big players in the Syrian thing? Uh, they're all reliant on the exact same architecture, which is somehow sought to be restored or somehow made more healthy in a place like Syria. It's a very difficult, to my mind, hopeless business. The other approach, since I believe the architecture is fundamentally flawed, so strengthening it here and weakening it there is fundamentally a contradictory thing, uh, is to squarely confront global problems with global solutions. This path is, of course, fairly close to the founding vision, for example, of the UN system. But the UN system has to design and support global conventions, agreements, and interventions with one hand tied behind its back, since its constituents are, after all, member states, uh, and the international non-governmental sector cannot be expected to solve all the world's problems either. So where might we look for some sort of systemic solution? In my view, the only route is by a hard re-examination of the territoriality dimension, and this is the, the point to which I want to come, about the architecture of the, of the nation state, the crisis it faces, and the question, where do we go uh, with it? Uh, the territoriality dimension of the modern system of nation states, including questions of borders, regions, movements, and policing. And the question here is, can we imagine a new sort of ecology of sovereignty? I used that phrase when I began. In which, instead of territory, because actually when you think about the architecture of nation state, the T word, territory, is the thing that holds it all together. You unravel territory and the whole thing comes apart. Can we imagine a new sort of ecology of sovereignty in which instead of territory, we install some other principle of local sovereignty, which might be ecological, industrial, or linguistic, for example, rather than territorial. This is a mind-bending exercise since we are so deeply wired to think of nations as, above all, sovereign territories, not just countries. But I think it is high time to start imagining these possibilities for alternative ecologies of sovereignty, or else we will live in a world of territorial sovereignties, but the world itself will have become an unlivable place. So let me pose the question even more sharply. Can we govern across borders? In the course of the 20th century, there's been a growing recognition that the system of nation states is not adequate to dealing with the biggest challenges facing the contemporary world, and I made much the same argument. The UN and subsequently a series of major multilateral organizations such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the WHO, the ILO, to name only the most well-known, have sought to work towards international agreements, strategies, and protocols to tackle global crises. In addition, a series of coalitions and organizations have formed in different regions and continents, examples including the now beleaguered European Union, ASEAN, MERCOSUR, and the Organization of African States, for example, to address problems that nations within a given region might face and which exceed their individual capacities. Finally, in the last five decades or so, there's been a remarkable explosion of transnational NGOs, T-NGOs, 
or international NGOs that have formed to tackle problems of poverty, housing, human rights, women and children, trafficking, discrimination, among many other issues. So global governance today is a complex patchwork of official, semi-official, and entirely non-official organizations that seek to address problems that transcend national boundaries or, or that do not seem to be priorities for national governments. This is the factual nature of the new ecology of sovereignty. So it's not that you have nation states and then you have some vague players, you know, pursuing individual. They're all claimants on sovereignty. The multilaterals are, the transnational NGOs are, they're all speaking politics. They're not just doing social work while the nation state does politics. This new assemblage of transnational governance organizations and uh, the challenges to national sovereignty that I've discussed throughout my talk force us to ask the question, how far have we come in address, addressing global challenges on a truly global basis. What can governance mean in an age when many major problems have become planetary in scope and when national interests often seem to be at odds with human and planetary interests? Who will speak for the planet? Who will speak for the species? And where will the power of these new voices and movements come from? A part of the answer to this question can be found in those political and social movements that seek to address and resolve problems on a global scale on a democratic basis without relying on the official power of nation states on the visions of religious or ethnic fundamentalism. The major examples of such global movements are environmentalist, feminist, and anti-poverty movements. In each of these cases, the issues are global in their scale, echo degradation, women's rights, and poverty. In each case, these movements include actors from the state system and actors from civil society. In each case, major philanthropic organizations are partnering with governments and corporations to find non-partisan solutions. In each case, youth are centrally involved since it is their future that is at stake. And in every case, these movements also face powerful opponents from states and from the corporate world who have their own agendas of power or profit. These movements are also trying to find new sources of funding, such as crowdfunding, new means of communication, often through social media, and new models of organization and mobilization, which do not require traditional bureaucracies and hierarchies. But against the hope, against the hope, which we might vest in these movements, and I have a great deal of such hope, are the variety of symptoms of a global swing to the right which we can see at the national level in the vision of Donald Trump in the US, in the leadership of Russia, China, the Philippines, in Narendra Modi's India, and the repressive Islamic regimes and movements of much of the Middle East. You can add other examples of your own, I'm sure. These regimes and movements seek neoliberal capitalist wealth on the one hand, while also encouraging cultural and political repression at home. Economic liberalization and cultural repression seem to go hand in hand in many parts of the world. These movements, parties, and states are symptoms of a worldwide politics of fear, which also thrives on demonizing migrants, refugees, and strangers. It is also, alas, visible in today's Germany. This global swing to the right needs to be connected to the forces of financial globalization with, with which I began my talk today, and the increasing conversion of large parts of the population to a debt-producing proletariat whose debt is then converted to marketable assets and instruments such as the financial derivatives which I discussed, which produce huge profits for the global financial elites while leaving most others in an increasingly precarious and volatile situation in which they became, become receptive to messages of fear, hate, and exclusion. Seen in this light, the battle against the forces of cultural suspicion, ethno-national purity, and authoritarian leadership cannot be addressed, in my view, without a hard look at the financialization of the world's wealth. Such wealth, I've already said, in my view, is not bad in itself, but its concentration and liquidity and the speed with which it eludes social regulation and democratic scrutiny are all enemies of democracy. These qualities need our attention, 
our imagination and our intervention. Without such intervention, we will find ourselves in a world of inequality, which is simultaneously a world of volatility and disorder. So, thank you very much.